Dr. Kelly just set me up here and I understand that you guys are having a test so we're going to go through the kidney from the ground up, okay? So the first thing is blood comes in through the afferent arteriole, hits the glomerulus and then goes out the efferent arteriole. So there are a few things that cause actions at the affer a a afferent uh, to, uh, the afferent arteriole. The first thing that happens is that either you vasoconstrict or you vasodilate. And basically what happens is there are some uh, molecules that cause vasoconstriction and some phenomenons that cause vasodilation. For example, you all know that vasoconstriction is occurs if you give a prostaglandin inhibitor such as uh, Motrin or any other NSAID. So prostaglandin itself is a vasodilator. On the other hand, a vasoconstrictive agent would be something such as angiotensin II. So when you get volume depleted, what happens is angiotensin II works at the level of the arteriole to vasoconstrict so that you preserve water and salt to establish your intravascular volume. Angiotensin II, as you know, is down the pathway from both uh, renin, from the renin system, and we're going to talk about that later. Prostaglandin is a, is a molecule which causes vasodilation when you vasodilate the afferent arteriole, what you effectively do is you get more blood that comes into Bowman's capsule, which is right here, and you can see my great drawing of the, of the uh, glomerulus here, stuff gets filtered and then it gets dumped into the lumen of the tubule. So <clears throat> first thing that happens is a ferrin arterial, filtration at the glomerulus, and stuff that gets filtered is urea, uh, electrolytes, water. So keep in mind when you're talking about filtration, the larger the molecule, in size, the harder it is to filter. So it filters much less than a smaller molecule. Same thing's, concern, same thing's true, the glomerular membrane tends to be negatively charged, so positively charged ions tend to uh, get filtered at a greater rate than smaller molecules. I mean, I'm sorry, then negatively charged molecules. So a positively charged molecule gets attracted to the membrane and goes through. The larger the molecule is, the harder it is to get through the porous membrane of the, of the glomerular membrane. For example, phosphate, divalent, di, uh, negatively charged ion actually has a much harder time getting filtered by the kidney than a positively charged ion such as a small positively charged ion such as sodium or potassium. Urea, which is neutral ion, or it, I should say a neutral molecule, gets freely filtered because it's small in size and then you dump it in your urine, provided that your glomerular filtration looks great. So that handles at the level of the glomerulus. When we go down to the proximal tubule, this is the proletariat of the kidney, and what happens at the proximal tubule is that most items get, most everything gets filtered. Sodium, potassium, chloride, that all gets filtered here. It gets filtered throughout the rest of the glomerulus too, and thus I'm not going to go over those uh, handling at this portion because it has the whole tubule, the whole tubule still available to reabsorb sodium and potassium and chloride as well as water. However, there are some things that are exclusively handled at the proximal tubular level and those include phosphates. So phosphates get totally reabsorbed at the proximal tubule. Uh, glucose does. So glucose and phosphates both do as well as most amino acids. And the way I remember amino acids is coal. We're going to come back to that. 90, 85 to 90% of your bicarbonate gets filtered at the proximal tubule, as well as your citrate. So all of these items are exclusively 
reabsorbed by the proximal tubule. They are all coupled to, they use an ATA, T, APTase pump, and they are all coupled to sodium handling as well. However, what you need to know is what is ex, ex, exclusively reabsorbed at the proximal tubule. Phosphate, not reabsorbed anywhere else. Amino acids, not reabsorbed anywhere else. So they get freely filtered, come down, glucose, same way. It gets reabsorbed in the proximal tubule only. So glucose is something you guys are familiar with because if somebody has diabetes, what ends up happening is they can't metabolize their, their glucose in a, in a proper manner and be utilized by the cell, so it builds up in the serum. So the renal threshold for glucose is around 150 to 200. So once the serum level gets above 200, then what ends up happening is the rest of that is filtered by the kidney. It normally, the kidney reabsorbs up to the amount of about 200 or 150, and then the rest of it gets dumped out in the urine. Thus, since it's not reabsorbed anywhere else, if you had a glucose in your serum of 600, that means that the renal threshold is about 200. 200 of the glucose comes back into the blood, but 400 is going to be uh, driving your urine output. And for every 700 milliosmoles that presents to the distal tubule, you get about a liter of urine produced. Thus, if you had 400 uh, uh, of a particular molecule, in this case it was, it's glucose as your osmolarity, then you're going to pee out about half of that, which is about 300 to 400. That's why you become dehydrated, even though you are losing, uh, you're losing fluid, you're, I mean, even though you, are, you would think the kidney would want to retain the water, in this case what happens is the glucose is the driving force which uh, causes you to pee out some water. Because if you just peed out a molecule, then you'd be peeing out essentially glucose rocks or sugar cubes, and you can't do that. So that's when glucose gets reabsorbed. The unique thing about phosphate is Phosphate is the only thing, the pediatric kidney, I happen to be a pediatric nephrologist, is the only thing that, pediat that the pediatric kidney handles better than the, uh, than the adult kidney. Thus, due to bone turnover and due to uh, the renal handling of phosphate, 90% of the phosphate gets reabsorbed. We see that in the proximal tubule, if not more than 95%. And therefore, the, uh, the pediatric patient tends to have a higher phosphate, uh, which is a good thing because they need that to grow with. Amino acids uh, are exclusively reabsorbed by the proximal tubule. And I said I remember coal. Uh, like I said, my name is Brett Lechner. I'm a peds nephrologist. And believe it or not, my dad, I grew up the son of a coal miner. My wife is the daughter of a coal miner. So we remember coal as our uh, way to remember amino acids. And with coal, what I mean is cysteine, ornithine, or ornithine, arginine, and you guys can write those in lysine. The other famous acid that gets exclusive re or the reabsorbed here is uric acid. So patients that have a high uric acid load, such as those with gout, or if you have cystinosis where you don't metabolize your cysteine appropriately, what ends up happening is if, you're, if your pH is very acidic in the urine here, the actual amino acid will crystallize out if the pKa is a value which uh, tends to make it lower than the pH in the urine and therefore the urine's pH is very low then what will end up happening is you'll crystallize out these particular amino acids as well as uric acid will do the same thing they each have their own pKa values but the crystallization will occur what will end up happening is the cells of the proximal tubule swell and you'll go into renal failure from that you'll also form stones so Uric acid is something else that is exclusively reabsorbed. So all the amino acids, uric acid, are exclusively uh, reabsorbed in the proximal tubule. As a matter of fact, uric acid is also often a predictor. If it's high in the serum, you don't have gout or you don't have a tumor of some sort, 
your cat acid can give you a hint as to if the patient's dry. If that number in the, the serum is very high, then it indicates that your uh, free water excretions higher or you you've had some free water that has been lost and therefore you are probably volume depleted at that stage. The other two things that I said were exclusively almost exclusively reabsorbed were was the uh, bicarbonate as well as citrate. Now as you know citrate actually dissolves calcium in solution and it is a preventer of stones Bicarbonate is the same way. So if you're dumping your bicarb because you have a you have a problem with your proximal tubular reabsorption, then you're unlikely to form stones. As a matter of fact, 85 to 90 percent of your bicarb will be lost. However, in the serum, if your bicarb is low, your serum is going to become acidic because it is the main one of the main buffers of acid which we take in uh, through proteins or by various things we eat that ends up buffering your acid. So if your serum bicarb goes low, then you have essentially become acidemic in your blood. And uh, with the loss of bicarb in the proximal tubule, this is known as a proximal tubular RTA, or renal tubular acidosis, because you have an inability to reabsorb your bicarb. Now keep in mind that 15 to 10 percent of your bicarb is going to be reabsorbed throughout the rest of the kidney. So in certain individuals, their bicarb in their serum, which is normally 24, might fall to 12 or might fall to 11. It's individually based, but the bottom line is that 10 percent is maintaining, the 10 percent the rest of the kidney reabsorbs the bicarb is maintaining that level in a proximal tubular RTA, it is known as a threshold uh, RTA or a type 2 because it was discovered after the distal RTA which we'll talk about. Now if you look at a particular uh, diuretic that works at this level, we would think of uh, acetazolamide or diamox. And what happens with diamox is it blocks the conversion as you know, in order to reabsorb, uh, reabsorb the bicarbonate, it's, it, it, what happens is bicarb and, and H ion, or acid, is converted through a series of steps to, to uh, water and carbon dioxide, and those are actually what's reabsorbed and thus diamox is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor and what it does is it blocks the ability of that conversion to water and CO2 to get reabsorbed thus you end up dumping the bicarbonate in this situation. So to recap the proximal tubular, tubal, ATPase coupled with uh, sodium uh, reabsorb the following items probably exclusively in the proximal tubule except for bicarbonate, we'll come back to that, I mean, which we said that 85 to 90 percent of it's uh, reabsorbed. So amino acids, think of coal, cysteine, orthene, arginine, lysine, uric acid, exclusively reabsorbed in the proximal tubule, citrate, which helps you not to form stones because it causes calcium to actually be dissolved in solution, helps you pee it out, and then uh, all of your phosphate is reabsorbed there. Now, people say, well, you get calcium phosphate stones. That's correct. The pH that's really high, so if you're a vegetarian and you consume a lot of milk or something that actually causes you to intake a, a lot of phosphate and you have very alkaline urine, at that case, you'll end up forming a, a calcium phosphate stone. So calcium phosphate stones form at very high pHs and all the acidic stones, such as uric acid or cysteine stones, form at the very um, low pH because the pKa causes them to crystallize out.